Shut up, fool! Now would be a good time to insert ads, says YouTube. Nah. Sapir Adi. Sapiri Adi. Sapir Ud. Whatever, however you pronounce your name. Uh, 10,000 pine points to you for being here first. I recognize you. Danny3648, you're here second, not first, even though you're not that bright. You get 5,000 pine points. And Jack, Jack Russell, 1,000 pine points to you. Um, you're a good dog. Rich Younger 9, I see you as fourth place. You know, nobody loves a young, rich person. Rich Younger 9 has a fleet of Ferraris in his garage. Nobody likes that. Why don't you just leave? Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, John Walton, uh, Randall Rouser, William Lake Craig, uh, maybe uh, Justin Briarley. We'll see what happens. And it's Theus Thursday, so you can call in. I don't know. I'm not in the, really in the mood to talk to Christians today or Muslims. I don't know why, but it is Theus Thursday. So here's what we'll do. If you want to talk to me, tag me. And then uh, tell me what you want to talk about. They say, Pine Creek, I want to talk to you about X. And then, uh, and then I'll give you the link. How's that? Lighting looks good today. Well, I, I'm experimenting. The older you get, the better the lighting has to be. I think I like it. I think that maybe I should be a little bit bigger. And I think, uh, yeah, that looks okay, right? You know, for living in Arizona, I still look pale. Well, then, then again, like who wants skin cancer, right? So it is, it is good to be, I was going to say it's good to be white. <laughs> I mean, it's good not to be uh, tanned from the sun because it causes skin cancer. It's good. Bye-bye, all you liberals. Come on, even, though, <clears throat> even the people who have dark skin shades, they laughed at that. I'm sure of it. Mic is good, too? I'm looking healthy and white, and the mic is good. Well, then, <clears throat> I guess we can start. To be honest, though, my... Dopamine levels are low nowadays. It's like there's nothing, nothing that exciting in the apologetics world anymore. It's just the uh, needy people wanting to be loved. Pine looks like he should know. Yeah, I look like vanilla ice cream, don't I? On a hot, hot day. I, I, I got to press this play button, but I can't do it. There's nothing in me says, listen to Randall Rouser talk about John Wall. Sound quality is tinny, says Roger. Well, you know what? I'm not giving you a refund. Okay, here we go. Begin. So Walton says, I'm going to read from here. A hot topic of discussion these days is the conquest of the land recorded in Joshua. Skeptics find this a soft spot for attack as they rant about a genocidal God, criticize a violent scripture, and challenge Christians about how they can serve a God who would do such a thing as command the annihilation of whole people groups. Let's just put the pause button there to begin with. Yeah, we got to, uh, I'm going to take Randall's advice and hit the pause button because Schleppi says, I need to wash his shirt. This is just out of the washer, Schleppi. I like Burgundy. It was my uncle who recently passed away a couple years ago. That's not recent, I guess. 
It was his favorite color. He bought all his cars this color. Isn't that amazing? On this passage. So, no, no, no. I do all my washing. I wash my own clothes. I cook my own meals. Um, what else do I do for myself? I do my own hair. Brush my own teeth. Like, even though I have servants who, you know, say smile, and then they, they, they could brush my teeth for me. But I, no, no, I do it myself. The first thing I want to say is, I think it, it's kind of uncharitable to say that skeptics are looking for a soft spot of attack, quote unquote, uh, or that they're ranting about a genocidal God. Uh, rather, I think many people, they are, are horrified and understandably so by violent biblical passages. Yeah, I agree with Randall here. You know, contrary to what some people think, I like Randall, and I would like to think he likes me. Uh, we're both Canadian. He has a soft spot for Mennonite people. I'm a Mennonite people. Uh, he, but he, he's right here. It, it, uh, who doesn't condemn this? Killing, wiping out a whole tribe of people. That's, here's the thing with all these Old Testament atrocities, and I'm going to tell it to you straight Christians, and you're not going to like it, and Jews and Muslims. You're not going to like it, but here it is. And you can click off after I'm done saying this and go do something more productive. But in history, we have tribes, and these tribes tend to fight over real estate. And these tribes who fight over real estate, a lot of them say that a god, their god, supports and says that they should do this. The Israelites are no different. Their God apparently likes real estate. They're, the humans like real estate, and they'll fight people to get real estate. It just seems so very human to me, doesn't it? And yet, we have so many Christians who thinks, think it's more likely that this God really does want a group of people to take over this land, rather than people just using a God to justify their actions. And maybe even give uh, some gravitas to those warriors, those fighters, to say, hey, God's on your side, you're going to be victorious. That's what it's all about. All you have to do as a Christian is read these difficult passages in the Old Testament and ask yourself, what's more likely, that a God's behind this, or humans just wrote this saying a God was behind it? And you're done. It takes courage to admit that this is just a human book, and there's nothing special about it. Such as those that describe. Okay, you can click off now. I'm going to keep going though. Describe the eradication and violent expulsion of entire people groups from territory. Um, in the same way that a Christian would be horrified at reading these kinds of accounts and some other religious texts. Yes. Uh, so, non Christians and non Jews are horrified when they read these things in a Judeo Christian text in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. It's not a matter of looking for a soft spot of attack. Yeah, who doesn't condemn this? <clears throat> William Lane Craig, uh, Braxton Hunter, uh, all of the, the very conservative evangelical types will not condemn this and say, well, those Canaanites, those uh, Mal Malachites, those Mennonites, they're evil people. They need to be wiped out. But, and we're going to get here, John Walton's excuse or defense of this is quite terrible, in my opinion. Or ranting about a genocidal god. Uh, I mean, rant is, is simply, I think, not a very charitable term. I mean, it, it's certainly people are, are uh, inflamed, perhaps, and under, again, understandably so. Okay, so then the next part. Christians are getting the message loud and clear. They are confused and disillusioned when they find themselves unable to launch a defense. The answers are not found in insisting that God must have had a good reason for wiping out the Canaanites, who presumably deserved it. Um, you, know, you know what I need to do, Randall? You're way too humble. Look what we can do with technology. You're way too humble. We need to see you as well. You're too small in this little tiny corner here. Let's put you right there. Let's put you at my feet. There we go. Answers always start with careful analysis of culture, genre, and text. 
And so to those topics, we turn our attention, and then he makes five points. This is the the one of the big takeaways, however, uh, for Walton's short article here, is um, the answers, he says, are not found in arguing that the Canaanites were so evil that they had to be eradicated. This is a sharp contrast with many conservative Christian apologists, yep. people like Paul Copan or Clay Jones, who have made much about the argument that the Canaanites were desperately, uniquely sinful and thus had to be violently eradicated. Yeah, it's so interesting to me, that argument. Those Canaanites, so evil, they were offering their children up uh, to their gods as sacrifices. So what, a, what does God command? To offer those same children up to him for sacrifice through war. And God was patient. He waited hundreds of years to do this, but the Canaanites didn't repent, didn't change their ways. Well, if they're so evil, why didn't God wipe them out immediately? I mean, God tolerates a little bit of evil? I guess so. A little bit of child sacrifice? Uh, I guess so. He sacrifices his own child. Like a cancer, lest they infect the Israelites with their sinful corruption. Walton says, no, that's not the way that we should think about it. Okay, so then uh, we turn on to uh, the first point. Uh, the meaning of the word harem, usually translated utterly destroy or place under the ban. Doesn't harem mean um, having a bunch of women to service your sexual needs? Oh no, that's harem. It needs to be reevaluated. It is a complicated word, but recent analysis suggests it has nothing to do with destruction. To designate something as harem means it is ineligible for human use. Therefore, God consistently refers to driving out the peoples of the land, especially so the Israelites do not absorb them as slaves or wives. The land and the cities belong to God. So the <laughs> you know what's interesting? <clears throat> slaves and wives used in the same sentence, like they're both for men's use. The inhabitants must be driven out, an act of eminent domain. The identity of these people in the land, not the persons, must be eliminated. Oh, first of all, I'm not a biblical scholar like Walton. That much is clear. I am aware that, that there has long... And I'm not a biblical scholar like Ren Rouser. Let's be clear. ...been dispute and debate about how to understand Harem. But I would, I would say this, first of all, is that the function of the word is understood and, and the implications, the God says in verse 16 and following, to leave alive nothing that breathes in the land, that sort of, I mean, that can be interpreted as, first of all, yes, hyperbole, perhaps, uh, which is something that Walton will touch on in a moment. I've never gotten this whole hyperbole excuse or apologetic. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean literally to wipe out everyone. Well, but you're still wiping out some people, and some of them could be innocent bystanders like women and children, which it really looks from the text says that's okay to do. Not just as collateral damage, but as actively doing it. Because you don't want these women becoming your wives and putting the evil thoughts in your head. And also, maybe it's a, a literary idiom for also making sure they're simply removed from the land, but it also involves killing. And in fact, if you look at uh, the actual account in Joshua, like in Joshua 6 and the destruction of Jericho, it describes men and women, everybody within the city being killed. Yes. So you have pretty straightforward descriptions of mass slaughter. Um, so to, to say, well, it doesn't mean utterly destruction, utter destro utterly destroy. It means uh, removing from use, ineligible for human use. Uh, I mean, I think that that's kind of niggling when, when you have niggling? the application word? of the term in context describing the mass slaughter of people. And I mean, what does it mean in a sense to remove humans from human use, right? If, if you, if the Canaanite- No, 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 this is not a new camera, Anthony H. Uh, thank you for giving me an excuse to, uh, to stop this. Uh, this is new lighting and it's not even new lighting. It's just moving my lights around, changing the bulbs. Like all those people who tell you you need a new camera, such and such a type of camera, nah, they're lying to you. 
You follow the Pine Creek rules, uh, the techniques for nine ninety five. I can get you to look as good as this. Nates <laughs> need to be removed from human use. Well, that would reasonably be interpreted as uh, taking their lives. Yes, uh, Nate, the, uh, the Randall Rouser is a progressive Christian. He is going to hell. So, second point. The, the genre of conquest requires literary analysis. As just, as just one of the important points, conquest accounts in the ancient world characteristically feature universalistic language. Taking this language seriously means not taking it literally. Throughout the literature of the ancient Near East, conquest accounts call for Taking the scripture seriously means not taking it literally. Oh, how does this apply to the resurrection? For and claim total destruction, though it is not clear that this is Though it is clear that this is not actually what happens or even what is attempted. I, I love that line, and, and I've, certainly it's a familiar line and one I've, I've long agreed with, that taking language seriously means not taking it literally. Now, obviously, that's not categorical, but the point is that in many cases, in order to take language seriously, you, it means not taking it literally. When Jesus says, you know, you, if you can have the faith that moves mountains, to take him seriously in what he's saying means not thinking he's simply talking about literally the ability to move millions of tons of granite. That's not the point, Jesus. Well, apparently Jesus could move millions of tons of water during the flood. This is making. So, so to take him seriously is not to just take him in a wooden, literal fashion, and, and so it is here. And I think certainly that is a fair point. And the text itself, I think, makes abundantly clear that certainly not everybody is slaughtered. Or many people are driven out. Uh, the third point, uh, one I would just say as well, implied there is, is that there is exaggeration. So we have stock phraseology for the destruction of all people. Again, leaving alive nothing that breathes. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean literally to kill every living human being. Fair enough. But you still have masses of numbers of people being slaughtered and everybody yep. else forcibly being drawn out. You know what? I'm sorry. One thing I forgot to mention here uh, in the first paragraph uh, that I did want to highlight. Um, when, when, um, gosh, I'm doing a lot of ums and uhs. My apologies. When Walton okay, says Randall, this is an perfect. act of eminent domain, like a, a government, for example, claiming the, lang the, the land of a particular individual, a privately owned land for the greater good of society. No, it's not eminent domain. This is what we call ethnic cleansing. By definition, this is today ethnic cleansing. Yep. So this is simply not an appropriate term to use in this context. Yeah, some of you Christians listening right now might be wondering, is Randall Rouser a Christian? Yeah, he is. And he just basically called what happened to the Canaanites as a type of ethnic cleansing. He did. So how does he deal with this? Well, he just says, you got to look at this through the lens of Jesus. And this actually is not who Jesus is. And so therefore, this is not, uh, this is humans talking. But to me, I just see this as a slippery slope. Where do you draw the line here? And I know Randall, we've talked about this. I've talked about this with him and he draws the line. Well, we can't trust what the gospels say about what Jesus said. And not just humans talking like here in, um, in the Old Testament. Okay, so then we have third. In the ancient literature, we find a recurring motif across cultures and time periods of the invincible barbarian. In the use of this motif, all sorts of negative descriptions are used for threatening enemies. These descriptions are not accusations of actual behavior that could be documented. The biblical descriptions of the Canaanites fall into this category. One of the intriguing elements of this motif is that the opponents presumably can be defeated only by the gods. So. I mean, that, the good point for, that a biblical scholar would make, uh, pointing out that this is, again, stock language being used to raise up your enemies as this huge force to be defeated, which is... A, wow, this is so refreshing, right? This is just so reasonable. People were like a few hairs short of being a baboons, baboons, baboon, baboon, baboons back then. This is... This is how you read the Old Testament. These evil, evil people must be defeated so we can take their land or our land that they currently reside in. To be understood rhetorically and not in a, in a flat, literal way. 
Fourth, from a theological perspective, we need to understand the nature of the land promises more clearly. One important perspective is that the conquest recapitulates creation and is an order-bringing event. A second is that it is to be Yahweh's land, not Israel's. It is Yahweh's land specifically in the sense that he has chosen it as the place where he will dwell. Uh, Israel is granted tenancy to serve as hosts to the divine presence. Fair enough. I mean, in, in the same way that many scholars have thought in Genesis 1, um, that the spirit hovered over the waters, for example, in Genesis 1-2, that kind of the implication here is that the waters represent the forces of chaos, and God is pushing back chaos and bringing cosmos or order, and there's something of a struggle there, but... Hang on a second. Got a Christian in here. Did anybody tell Doug he looks sick and needs a blood transfusion yet? Or perhaps the vampires do exist? Huh. I remember you, Bradley, in my comment section. Always negative. Uh, I need to know, Bradley, are you over 18? If you're 18 or under, please tell your parents where you are right now. I mean, not a struggle that God is trying hard, but rather there's a, maybe a more appropriate to say a process, a process of bringing chaos into cosmos of God imposing order. Likewise, uh, as the Canaanites are driven out of the land, representing the forces of chaos, the Israelites come in, they impose God's order. Oh, this is where Rob from Sen Sentinel Apologetics gets it from, from John Walton, this whole chaos thing. Chaos this, chaos that. And Christianity brings order to the chaos. And he dwells within the land. Fair enough, but of, of course, that's important from a literary perspective and perhaps a theological perspective, but really doesn't provide any ethical explanation as to what is actually described in space-time as occurring. And then fifth, whoops, uh, so fifth, um, he's almost done, by the way. The status way. of the Canaanites then should not be understood as those who are guilty of heinous crimes. The characterization is rhetorical. Uh, again, this what, is- What, the Canaanites weren't really evil? That was just rhetoric? I think a really important point, uh, which places Walton very sharply opposed to people like Clay Jones and Paul Copan, who really try to offer an apologetic saying the Canaanites were just so heinous, so terrible, so bad that they had to be mass slaughtered and forcibly driven out of the land because they presented a real imminent threat to the Israelites. Here, Walton is saying, no, th this is stock language. But again, this raises the- This is stock language. I wonder if there's any stock language in the New Testament. Issue another level than ethically. If these people weren't so terrible, how could you justify a description of forcing them out of the land and slaughtering them? Uh, well, this brings me to, to the final two paragraphs of conclusion, which I think there's some really interesting things here that Walton says. So first of all, he says, these points do not resolve our ethical concerns about the conquest. Uh, the death, warfare, violence remain realities. Absolutely true. There, there is no apologetic here, I think, as such. Oh, there's definitely a apolog... Tell that to <laughs> a lot of people I critique. They will apologize for this left and right. Uh, but he says the events recorded in Joshua must not be confused with holy war or jihad. Jihad. Uh, oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not persuaded by that. I think that concepts of holy war and jihad. Yeah, what actually is the difference between what the Israelites did to the Canaanites and jihad? Is there a difference? Oh, this, if you want to really bother certain varieties of evangelical Christianity or evangelical Christianity compare what God did to jihad. Oh, they hate, they hate Muslims. I mean, Islam, they hate Islam and Sharia law and all that. So if you start saying, yeah, that was quite the jihad that Yahweh did in the old Testament. Ooh, that'll send shivers down their back. Jihad are broad enough that you could actually see very much what Walton has just described in this short article as conforming to some broad concept of, of God bringing holy war or jihad upon apostate uh, peoples in, in favor of his people. Um, but what I want to conclude with is what I found was maybe most interesting uh, is that Walton kind of ends with what I think is the spirit, what I call in my book, Jesus Loves Canaanites, the, the spiritualization of the text often has been understood in terms of allegorization historically. He says the application of the- Did you just say spirit spiritualization and allegory are similar? Passage does not offer a pattern for a just war theory or provide justification for anyone's battle, no matter how just the cause. 
Application is found instead in the covenant pattern it offers for driving out that which is inimical to the presence of God. For us, that means we drive out the oh. old man and adopt our identity in Christ. We are crucified with Christ, yet we live. So there is a theologization. Oh. Of the John Walton is comparing the Canaanite situation, killing of the men, women, children, livestock, to driving out your old self so you can be born again, the new man versus the old man. Oh, come on. That's a reach. ...of the text in order to apply it to the life of the Christian today, that what we should think of in terms of the literary form of the text as it comes to us is that it shows how, as the ancient Israelites drove out the Canaanites from the land, removed uh, their their presence, so we need to drive out our sinful impulse. <laughs> exactly right, Nathan. This is the inner jihad. Got to drive out your inner demons. ...is within us and remove that presence. But we should never think that we can apply this in any way to actual people groups and provide a justification for violence and war. I mean, I um, I think that that's, that's a very, can be very helpful, especially if, if you think, in addition, ask this question, well, where did this text come from? Where did Deuteronomy and Joshua come from? And biblical scholars generally believe. Um, I think it probably is fair to say it's a consensus opinion, but certainly not a universally held one. There are still people who think that these texts were written by Joshua or others, contemporaries or people close to the time of Joshua. But most scholars think that these texts, Deuteronomy and, and Joshua, were not written by Moses and Joshua. What? Uh, what? Oh my goodness. You mean my pastor lied to me? But rather were, were written centuries later or compiled into final form centuries later, likely at the time of, of the Josianic reforms and just later, so from the 620s into the 570s uh, and the time of, of the expulsion, the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 and, and the expulsion or into Babylon, where the Israelites were sent into Babylon, many of them. And within that context, uh, see, then we say, okay, so the original readers of Deuteronomy and Joshua were people who were being sent into exile in a foreign land, many of them. And within that context, the message that comes through in Joshua or Deuteronomy is not, you have now a template to potentially eradicate, kill, and destroy other peoples. Rather, the message that comes through is you need to maintain your distinctiveness, drive out uh, sinful impulses, things that are not part of your covenant fidelity to Yahweh, and maintain them. No, 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 no. 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 Tribes, real estate, want real estate, kill people who have my real estate. It's as simple as that, Randall. that covenant fidelity even in exile. And likewise, we as Christians today can seek to do those same things. And so that would be, I mean, I think that fits into this spiritualization, if not in the sense a broad sort of allegorizing of the text. And I, I think that is a good starting point. And is there anything in the New Testament you allegorize when it comes to Jesus? Could uh, the resurrection be an allegory for something? Potentially, I think a much better. Can we get John, John Dominic Crossan in here, Satan? Approach to begin to think about the ethics and theology of the text than that conservative apologetic strategy that says, here we have one of those occasions where genocide was warranted, where you were in fact uh, justified. The Israelites were justified in slaughtering and driving out another people group because they were morally corrupt. Uh, beyond redemption and equivalent to a sort of cancer on the landscape so that you even had to kill their infants. Uh, this, I think, is a much better approach. <laughs> Duh. I'm sure it helps you sleep at night. But, I mean, the conservative evangelicals, I think, have a right when they're reading the scriptures in the Old Testament. God said, go wipe them out. That's what it says. Now, that might cause you angst, Randall, 
But that's what the text says. Now you have to massage and manipulate the text in order to say, okay, yes, it says that, but that's not what it really means. You've got to allegorize it. Although, of course, it still leaves unaddressed the remaining question. Is that which is described in Deuteronomy and Joshua something that actually did occur at some point in the... Criticizing Randall Rouser is what lefties call punching down? No! I'm punching up. I'm not even punching. I'm basically... I understand Randall Rouser's position here and why he says this, because if the God he worships every Sunday, or every day, I should say, and prays to without ceasing every day, if this God is, if that, this passage, if these passages are a reflection of this God's nature, this guy here wants nothing to do with it. So he has to change it. He has to view it differently. Otherwise, the Jesus that he worships is not the Jesus that he worships. Past, in this case, approximately 700 years earlier, maybe 1270 or 1280 BCE. Um, if the text was written in, you know, 600, 580 BCE, then you have it, you know, describing events close to 700 years earlier or so. Did, the, did those events actually happen? And if not, how should we understand the function of these texts uh, in terms of their historical narration within canon? Those are important theologically. Yeah. Did those events actually happen? Did the resurrection actually happen? New Testament? Yes. Old Testament? Maybe not. Cool questions, historical questions, and ethical questions. Uh, and But uh, certainly beyond, I think... Exactly right, Bob Smith. Stuff I like, literal. Stuff I don't like, allegory. The purview of this video to explore them. I just found it intriguing uh, that Walton offers this sort of spiritualization at the end of his passage and also offers something of a smackdown, I think, to some of the apologetic attempts to defend the Canaanite genocide. Yeah. Okay, uh, Nathan wanted me to watch this, and another guy wanted me to watch this. This is uh, William Lane Craig. So you just became a Christian, did you? How many new Christians do we have here in the live stream chat? Welcome if you're a new Christian. Um, do I have your permission to cause you to doubt? I do, I do, I do. Well, thank you very much. Please stay seated. Here we go. Just become a Christian. The moment you responded to Christ, a number of... Oh, European Jesus. Is this who you responded to, Christians? European Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> who does he look like? Who does Jesus look like? Those eyes are so big. This is almost like Disney Jesus. Look at that hair. I got hair envy. You know, when people told me, I, Doug, you just need to be more like Jesus, I thought they were talking about the hair. Things happen to you. First, you were given new life. You began a relationship with... Yes, yes. You, when you become a Christian, you be given a new life. Because your old life sucked. So it's really good to have a new life when the old life sucked. What if your life didn't suck? What if your life was really good? Does your new life become bad? Well, you might. You're called to suffer for Christ's sake. And then you're given a relationship with God, a relationship where you can't see God, you can't touch God, you cannot smell God, but you have a relationship with God. He doesn't audibly talk to you, but you have a relationship with God. You'd rather spend an hour at Starbucks with God rather than spend an hour meditating on his word, most of you, but you still have a relationship with God. If this God decided to ignore you, you wouldn't know the difference because you still believe that he has a relationship with you, but you still have a relationship with God. God that will last forever. Oh, so what? What? You began a relationship with God that will last forever. You have a relationship with God that will last forever. How, can someone guess what I'm thinking right now? No, you can't guess it. Ravi Zacharias. You became a Christian. You had a relationship with God, or do? Did Ravi Zacharias 
his relationship with God lasts forever? Oh, you Christians don't know what to do now. I mean, he lied, he deceived, he used his power and influence to put uh, uh, women into compromising situations. I mean, Ravi Zacharias has a relationship with God forever. So Christians, when you die and go to heaven, or at the end times, whatever, uh, go, go find Ravi. Have a talk with him. Ask him if, uh, what he really did back then. <laughs> uh, I mean, once saved, always saved. Are you, can you use your free will to end the relationship with God? Or once you accept God, your free will has been removed from rejecting God? This forever thing. Ooh, controversial. Second, you gained a new status before God. You went from being under God's just condemnation. Just condemnation. You, were, you didn't have any free will to be born. You were born with a sinful nature, according to will, Billy's uh, worldview. And you were condemned for just, for something you didn't have any control over. The default position is to sin. The default position is the sinful nature. To being fully pardoned. Of fully pardoned. All your sins. Third, you were adopted into a new family. Oh, wow. Look at that family. We got diversity. Every shade of skin color. That's important. From all cultures, it looks like. No, 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 no. These, this is one culture. These are all Mennonites, I'm sure of it. As a child of God, you now belong to a huge and incredibly diverse global family. Yeah. It's really important to be a part of a family so you can feel loved, right? I think the members of the Branch Davidians, Davidians, they were members of families too. They, they were part of a one big family. The Mormons are part of a big family, and it's global and diverse. So when you become a Mormon, you, you belong to a huge and incredibly diverse global family. You know, there's Mormons in South America and Europe, Asia. There's probably even Mormons in Russia, but don't tell Putin that. Fourth, you were given a new job. You now represent... With benefits. Not only did you get a new job, but you got a new job with like the ultimate in healthcare after you're dead. Christ, with your words and actions to everyone you meet, God wants to grow his family through you. Ah, uh, I don't think this works though. Because I think, I think if you compare a typical Christian with a typical non Christian, you're not going to see a difference. In fact, if you compare the typical non-Christian to a typical Christian, you might actually find that the typical non-Christian is a better example than the Christian. Fifth, you also have new enemies. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a scope on my gun and it looks, it's red like this. Yeah. Back to trouble. Target acquired. <laughs> this world will pressure you to conform. Your conform. old nature will betray you and the forces of darkness. Oh, oh, look at this. We got to look at these words. Destroy, isolation, chaos, God is evil, pornography, fear, lust, anxiety. You don't, who wants this stuff? I mean, this is all terrible, terrible stuff. So you got to resist this. Oh, more. There is no God. Life is meaningless. Nothing matters. Kill yourself. More anxiety. Oh, and pornography is right in the center. You Christian men. You're what? There's a few Christian men watching right now. There's, I know. I see you. I see you in the live stream chat. Some of you are even older. You Christian guys, you're listening right now. And uh, 
Look at this word here, pornography. Oh my goodness. You wake up in the morning and you know what you guys do. And then you say, I'm sorry, God. And then the next morning's the same. Oh, you, you do the things you don't want to do and you don't do the things you know you should do. Poor guys. And girls. But you also have a powerful new ally. Oh, now this is good. I like powerful new allies. The instant you committed your life to Christ, God's spirit moved in. Oh, it moved in right into the chest area. And it looks like a cloud. Actually, this is biblically true. The, most people think that God is a trinity, but he's actually more than three. God manifests himself. He is a cloud. If you read the Old Testament, he hovers like a cloud. He's also a bush. He's, you know, he's, he was burning in a bush. There's many persons of God. And took up permanent residence in your heart. Of permanent residence. Oh, this is back to Ravi. God's spirit took up permanent residence in Ravi Zacharias. Mind. Allow him to empower and guide you as your journey unfolds. Yeah. I wonder how, how effective the Holy Spirit is at doing this. Yeah, those Christians who sin every day and have to repent every day. How effective is this Holy Spirit in empowering you and guiding you? Keeping you on the right path. If you stumble and do wrong, confess it immediately to God. Claim his forgiveness and yield yourself anew. Okay, so the Christians listening right now, you do this every day. Some of you do this every hour. And then you get tired. And then you forget. And you just go around this loop over and over and over again, right? Am I resonating with you guys? This is what you do, right? Around and around we go. To God's spirit. The productive Christian. Meanwhile, you're kind of life sucks for you. This new life that you got. Oh, now this is interesting. We've got a guy in a boat. The productive Christian does not rely on his own efforts. Rather, he relies on God's spirit. Oh, isn't that interesting? You know what's interesting is this. You got like some really deep theological points given here in this illustration. How much of, the, of the, your progress is the Holy Spirit blowing you forwards? And how much of it's your own growing? You know, studying the scriptures is hard work. Being disciplined in your, your walk with God, in your quiet time, your reading of the scriptures, your prayer, that takes dedication, discipline, and work. But how much of that's actually the Spirit causing you to do that? And how much of it's you? Well, it looks like it's a bit of both. Own here. efforts. Rather, he relies. See, but it looks like he's just, the rowing's not really doing anything. It's the wind that's doing it. And he's just rowing to make it look like he's doing something. It's on God's spirit. As the Apostle Paul wrote, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives through me. When a branch is connected to the vine, it just produces fruit naturally. Naturally. On the other hand, the unproductive Christian is performance oriented. He tries to be good enough by his own grinding self effort, but feels guilty because he can never do enough. Oh. Yeah, that's a bad feeling, right? To feel guilty and, and grind and do the hard work and of discipline. I, I tell you. Do, don't you admire athletes, William Lane Craig? Who have discipline, dedication, grind, they work hard. Don't you appreciate their efforts? Why wouldn't you appreciate it when Christians do it with their spiritual lives? Trying to live the Christian life in your own strength just makes you miserable. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a new life. And the Holy Spirit guides you. But if you don't do it this way, you'll be miserable. So, how do you rely on the Holy Spirit on a daily basis? 
First, as soon as you are step one aware of any sin in your life, confess it to God. Don't hide and rationalize your disobedience. God is eager to forgive and draw you near again. This is interesting. This is also very deeply theological. So if you sin, recognize it right away, repent of it, and God is eager to forgive and draw you near again. So here's my question to Christians listening right now. Do you believe that's true? Warning, this is a trap question. Do you believe that if you sin, and ask God to, and you repent of your ways, you ask God to forgive you, that God is eager to forgive you and draw you near again. Do you believe that? Now, most Christians, are going, well, I, Doug just told me there's a trap question, but it sure sounds like the answer is yes. I mean, yeah, you know, if I sin and I repent and ask God to forgive me, he, he is just and, and willing to forgive me. It says that in Scripture, yeah, Doug, the answer has to be yes. Well, guess what? Then you don't need Jesus to die on a cross and rise from the dead bodily, do you? If God can forgive you from you merely asking him to and repenting, why do you need Jesus to die on a cross? Well, I know the answer you're going to give, but really think about it. Before Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, you could sin, repent, Ask God to forgive you. After Jesus died on the cross, if you sin, you can repent. Ask God to forgive you. So what's this Jesus thing then? Why do you need Jesus? If God can forgive just by you repenting and asking for forgiveness. See, your repenting and asking God forgiveness is not sufficient, is it? This is technically not fully correct, is it? You will only do it if, I don't know if you're a Calvinist, you say, because if you're one of God's elect, or if you're a non-Calvinist, if you've accepted the gift of salvation, then God will forgive you and draw near to you again. Am I making too big of a deal of this? Is this? Probably am. Then, recommit yourself, body and soul, in continual daily service. Yeah, so here's my question to Christians listening. How often do you guys do this? How often do you recognize your sin, repent, ask God for forgiveness, and then recommit? Let me ask you this. How many times a day do you sin? Once? Twice? Five? Ten? This would become so tiresome. You got to recommit yourself to God, uh, repent and, and ask for forgiveness, what, 24 times a day? Even in your dreams, you're sinning, right? Some Christians believe that. My goodness, you guys must be tired. Surrender to God. Ask his spirit to guide you and strengthen you. Yeah. Now go look on, the, on your life, Christians. Look back on your life of how many times you've done exactly what Bill Craig says. And then ask yourself this question. How effective has the Spirit been in guiding you and strengthening you not to do it again? Maybe that's strong evidence that the Holy Spirit's not there. Oh, if I want to be really uh, critical, I could say the Holy Spirit does exist, but he's not in you. You th just think you're a Christian, but you're not. Uh, but that's a little too cruel, right? It's better off just to say, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. <laughs> As this Spirit-filled life within you grows, you will be gradually transformed. Gradually transformed? What? What? Gradually? I thought when you accept Christ, you become a new creation, not gradually a new creation. How long does it take? 10 years, 20 years for this transformation? 
I guess Bill is saying here, it doesn't ever stop, right? You just constantly change. That's called maturity. That's, that's, guess what? As a non-Christian, I can do that too. I can gradually become transformed too. Just through life experience, learning new things, realizing, oh, if I do A, B happens, so I'm not going to do A if I don't want B to happen. I'm gradually being transformed. You'll hunger for the truth of God's Word, the Bible. Begin reading it today and invite God's Spirit to teach you as you go. Yeah, this reminds me of Mormons. Invite God to, while you read the Book of Mormon, and God's Spirit, the Holy Ghost, Mormons like to use the word ghost, the Holy Ghost will help you. But I bet you anything Bill Craig thinks that Mormonism is a type of cult. But he doesn't see it in his own beliefs. You can start with the Gospel of Mark. You'll also learn. Why start with the Gospel of Mark? Just because it's the first Gospel written? Learn to live in community with other believers. Ah, oh, yes, this is very important. Live in community with other believers. Stay in a bubble. Don't listen to guys like me who might sow seeds of doubt, who put pebbles in your shoe. Because you realize what's at stake here. I might be sending, leading you to hell. So you want to stay close to all these people. In fact, you should probably just do what your pastor says. God has given all authority to, to, of men uh, to shepherd his flock. And, and so if there's an elder or a pastor who says, don't take this job or marry this person, like you probably should listen to them, right? This control of your life. Hmm. Maybe that's why I'm not a Christian anymore, because I'm a bit of a maverick. I never, be when I was a Christian for 35 years, I never became a member of a church. Because I didn't want some stupid man telling me what to do with my life. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And the thing is, now I'm going to be very honest. I'd say um, nine out of 10 of my elders, pastors, preachers were probably more stupid than me. There was like one out of 10 that was pretty bright. But this is how they get you. This is how they keep you. This is how they get you and keep you. You're special as long, no. You're special to God and you're special to us because you're part of our family now. You're in our community now. When your wa um, hot water tank breaks, don't worry, we have someone in the church who can help fix it for you. Oh, you're pregnant? You're having a baby? Oh, we have a community of people who will bring food for you. See, it's very attractive, isn't it? But it's this attraction to help serve your needs that leads you to believe terrible things, like the slaughter of the Canaanites, for example, that we just went over. Following Jesus is not something you do in isolation. Get together with other believers to worship, pray, and study the Bible. And remember, each of us is a work in progress. So be patient with the shortcomings of your brothers and sisters, just as God is patient with you. Following Christ is the adventure of a lifetime. Really? Your day-to-day -day experience may not get easier. In fact, you may face greater hardships. Yeah, that's why heaven better be real, right? If life is a vapor, if real meaning, ultimate meaning, which is God, God meaning, is because of this concept of eternity, then, and if, if the scriptures are right, that you're, you should suffer for Christ's sake and that you should be ex expected to be persecuted, 
And really, heaven better be real. I mean, Paul said that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then um, we ought to be pitied. But I think Paul was wrong. I think you Christians should be pitied if heaven isn't real. Like you need this. You, you need this to be real for uh, the crap you guys go through of constantly feeling this guilt of sin and shame of not meeting a certain standard. And then having guys like me kind of laugh at your beliefs. I mean, if there's no vindication at the end, like, oh my goodness, I pity you. Heaven better be real. Can I get an amen from Christians? <laughs> you will sense the deep satisfaction oh. of knowing God. You will sense. What sense is it? The sense of smell, touch, hearing, seeing. What, 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 what sense are you talking about? The sense is divinitatis. And how would you know if that sense is, is from God or has anything to do with the God or just in your own head? I tell you, Mormons sense a deep satisfaction knowing God. I bet you Hindus, some Hindus sense a deep satisfaction of knowing Vishnu. There are many false religions in the world where its adherents will sense a deep satisfaction of knowing their God, which doesn't exist. This is a problem. This is in the philosophical realm. This is called a, a defeater, a deep Deep defeater. Wrap it up, Billy. And enjoying him forever. Oh, yes. And this gets back. Whenever I see the word forever, I think Rabbi Zacharias. Rabbi Zacharias, you will sense a deep satisfaction of knowing God and enjoying him forever. Unless you live a life of debauchery and chicanery. Well, then it's not forever, right? Well, no Christians would live their life that way. Oh, really? Who is that passage written to? The Corinthians, yes. Okay, there is one more thing. Two notifications. Yeah, I'm not very popular. Can I make this big? Does that... There we go. Justin Brierly. I'm mainly just playing this because of the clothes he's wearing. This is not just about winning an argument. It's about actually showing someone what it looks like to be a Christian. You know, you may have... This is what it looks like to be a Christian. A shirt that's been in the wash a little too long. A little too short. Crinkly... Uh, shorts and a haircut from Supercuts. <laughs> no, I shouldn't talk. I don't look uh, any better than Justin Briley. But yeah, this is what it looks like to be a Christian. And what's with the background music all the time? I, I can be effective with no soothing background music. Why do you guys need it? In the world. But if your life doesn't look attractive, people aren't going to be convinced because they're not going to want what's on offer at the other end. You know, people have to want, people have to not just be shown that Christianity is true through argument and evidence. They have to, they have to be shown why they want it to be true. Why do you want it to be true? So you can live forever in heaven? Because it's not, it's not here for on earth, right? And that's a different thing. Well, Jesus did say, I've come to give life to the full, but he was talking about eternal life. Jesus said, take up your cross like he did. That's, that's, it's, you know, there's that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You have to make people thirsty for the gospel. You have to show them why it makes a difference, not just, you know, the reasons for why you believe it's true. Yeah, okay. Now, here's a question for Christians listening. <clears throat> My name's Doug. I'm a relatively successful person living in a relatively safe place in the United States. 
relatively uh, nice guy. Keep to myself, mostly a homebody. Love my wife and kids, provide for them. Find great meaning in that. Um, don't have to pray to pay my electric bill. Here's my question for Christians listening. Why do I need Christianity? I literally I can count on one hand the amount of times I've been anxious in my life, once or twice. I kind of like pressure. I was a great test taker growing up. I loved someone having a stopwatch on me. So I've never suffered with anxieties or depression. Never had a disease that I needed to pray to God to help cure. Why do I need Christianity? I have as many friends as I need. I don't need a lot of friends. I don't need a big community. I don't need people to, I didn't need people to bring us food when my wife was pregnant. I actually preferred they didn't because a lot of the food they made sucked. Why do I, Doug, Pine Creek, need Jesus? There's only one answer, right? For a guy like me, who's relatively independent, self-sufficient, why do I need Jesus? Justin, you could be the most moral, noble, great role model on the planet. Not for one second would I equate that to Christianity, because there's people like that who are not Christians. I asked my wife this question years ago, uh, probably a year or two after I left Christianity. She could not answer it. I'm asking you Christians now. I think I said to my wife, if you take out heaven, why do I need Christianity? And even heaven, I don't desire it. I did not desire to live forever. For, so I'm saying this because what Justin is saying here will never, ever appeal to a guy like me. What it will appeal to are desperate people, needy people, people who suffer through addictions, death, trauma, people who are desperate to have food on the table, shelter, clothing. You take, when I say I don't even desire heaven, but if you take heaven off the table, there's no answer to this question. And if you take what I'm saying to its extreme, basically Christianity is for, is for losers. <laughs> right? Christianity is for losers, for the needy, the desperate. The people who've had just a bad shake in life. In fact, I should be fair and say all religion are for losers. <laughs> but we're all losers, right, in life? And we're mostly losers, sometimes winners. Yeah, Scientology might be for winners because you have to have a lot of money just to get into it. Okay, I'm going to open up the room. I'm not going to wait around forever. Hey, it's only been an hour. I'm making better time now. But if you dilly-dally, I'm just going to leave. 
I'm just going to say goodbye, maybe take a nap. And whereby is up. I'll just put the link in. And why should I become a Muslim? Why should I become a Mormon? Why? Bring on the crazies. I'm tired of crazies. Rooms open. You just click on the link. Oh, Tangelo, don't call in. I don't want to talk to you. You've talked too much already. Say Shroud of Turin and then go home. Then leave. Say fine tuning and then leave. I would love to talk to someone I haven't talked to before. But I can't be greedy. No, don't worry, Germania. I'm not going to allow Tangelo in. I've had enough. Yeah, if there's any Christians who are not losers, <laughs> call in. Yeah, I got to get some uh, powder on my forehead. Myron, can you look into that? Uh, get the expensive stuff, though. Um, Chanel? No, that's perfume, right? What, what's the most expe expensive brand of makeup? You get some, like, Rouge, maybe? Yeah. I don't, just find makeup that make me looks, makes me look pretty. I don't want to look like a loser. I don't want to look like Justin Brierley. Tight criteria tonight. Yeah. Was that disc golf video really Jim Bob? No, it wasn't. But it sure looked like him though, right? That was the beauty of it. Myron is back? Yeah, he never left. Attangelo, yeah. Just forget about me, Attangelo. Just live your life. Just live your life knowing that I will be effective in leading more and more people to hell. <laughs> and that you are powerless to do anything about it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Winger went viral in a video montage recently about submitting to husbands. Really? Do you have a link? I guess I could go on this. Are you talking about a short or like a long video? Religious people live longer. Well, that's because of the community aspect. Have I listened to Daniel Hakatukutukuchu? Yes. Daniel Hachu. Makeup does not need to be expensive. I don't want to put on cheap makeup. What makeup? What am I, a hooker? I mean, a gigolo? No, if I'm going to put on makeup, it's going to be expensive stuff. Made from... Um... Oh, I, can't, I won't say that. <laughs> 
Soylent moisturizer. Yeah, that's what I need. Well, I can I can get rid of the glare on my forehead without makeup. Let's see if I can do it. Watch this. Oh, it's still there. Yeah. Maybe I can't. Religious people have lower levels of stress, I think. Uh, that I'm not sure about. I need a citation, please. It's 2022. Men can apparently be hookers, too. You make a great point, Royal Wolf 7. Have I heard of Nicholas the Proclaimer? He's a bit unhinged. I think I have. Does he have a beard? Baby powder? You could just do this. Now I look like a Muslim woman. Actually, this is a good idea because I've been told that I caused some Christian women to stumble by just being too sexy. They look at my forehead and they go, I want me some of that. I've heard the opposite, Lawrence Brown. Yeah, this is the Shroud. The Shroud of Pine Creek. Maybe I need to do this. That way people uh, know I'm serious about letting them in. <laughs> 1,000 pine points to Jeff, just tuning in. Pine Creek's wife is hot. Yeah, I, or you, talk, you better be talking about me. I mean, me or whatever. I thought it was funny. I, I bought a new mic, yes, but it's the same mic as the old mic, just newer. Tell you, if I died right now, there would be a radiation glowing off of my head onto this towel. And then 2000, uh, 1,300 years from now, scientists will dig it up and say, how could this have been made? I'm going to look up that Mike Winger thing. But I can tell you what Mike Winger believes. In. Not even listening to him. Yes, women should submit to that. Christian, stop cohabitating. Cohabitating. Do you want to learn to think biblically about everything? Let's see here. I endorse husband leaders. Oh, this. What I'm going to Let's see. Let's go over here. Over here. Here.
suggest is the constant danger of being an authority and being a leader in any way, shape, or form is that you become a jerk. If men are supposed to love their wife like Christ loved the church, what does that look like in a marriage? Which I think you've, have you really talked about this? Yeah. I know I, well, these questions run together. Mike, you put on weight. I'm going to fat shame you. Lose some weight. Your body's a temple for the Lord. At some point, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I have a video on, like, how to be a husband that's online that some, some of you might have seen. Um, but just going through the biblical examples of this. So the New, the New Testament affirms. Here's, I'll just make a cool observation about this. The New Testament affirms a husband's leadership in the home, right? The, the wife submits to the husband, that sort of thing. Um, so it affirms the headship of the husband in the home, uh, which I take to mean primarily he gets like the final call in matters related to the household. Not that like, he's like, wear those shoes, not those. Submit, submit, submit. Every single thing. Like peanut butter more. Like, I don't know that it's <laughs> meant to be that. Um, what is it meant to be? But whenever the New Testament talks about leadership, it never emphasizes the authority of the leader. It emphasizes the danger of their own leadership. It's kind of interesting how this works. So Jesus talks about the apostles, and they're like, who's going to be great among us? Right? And he, he, they were talking about this, and he responds, you know, the Gentiles, they lord it over, their rulers lord it over, but not amongst you. Whoever's great among you will be the servant of all. What I'm going to suggest is the constant danger of being an authority and being a leader in any way, shape, or form is that you become a jerk. You are, you are. You notice he's not answering the question. Okay, this is. This is so fun, sad and fun at the same time. Come on, Pam. This is timestamp one twenty nine. Let's go back to what the question was. Every single thing. Wife submits to the husband, that sort of thing. It's online that some some of you might have seen. Well, I, these questions run together at some point. So yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, marriage, which I think you've have you really talked about this? Yeah. I know. I, well, these questions run together in any way, shape, or form. What's the question? Constant in any way, shape, become a jerk. Your wife, like Christ, loved the church. What does that look like in a marriage? Which I think you've. Okay. The question is, what does it look like? And it says, love your wives like Christ loved the church. What does that actually look like? So far, he's just said what it doesn't look like. So timestamp 129, let's go back to that. We're inconsiderate to the people around you. You're, you're, you don't think carefully about the consequences of your decisions on their lives. You do things because you want to do them and not because they'll be a blessing to others, which is why Jesus is, says, let's make it about servanthood. So I think the husbands, interestingly... When you apply this to marriage, the husband is never told to lead his wife in the Bible. Now, his leadership is affirmed. Don't get me wrong. This is where the progressive would be like, he's never told to lead his wife. <laughs> so there is no leadership. Right? No. Like, let's read the whole Bible in context. Like, there's definitely headship for a husband, submission from the wife. That's true. But why is it that the Bible never seems to tell a husband you have to lead? The question is, what does it look like when it says for a husband to love his wife like Christ loved the church? What does that look like? Still hasn't answered it. You said what it doesn't look like, but not what it does look like. Because the greater concern is that the man would be lovingly self-sacrificial to his wife. This means it will feel like you have lost your power because your power is meant to serve someone else. That's a good point. And that's healthy. So this is why. Like I'm like, hey, yeah. If there's a sacrifice to be made between us, I try to choose her as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I do it really well, all the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, but I mean, as long as I'm, I'm thinking godly about things, that's, that's what I do. So, okay, that might be one answer. You do what your wife wants? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I do it really well, all the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, but I mean, as long as I'm, I'm thinking godly about things, that's, that's what I do. So the danger of people in leadership is they abuse people they lead. They frustrate them with bad behavior and decisions, inconsiderate stuff. They devalue them by putting themselves first over. You guys do it too. Like here I come and, oh, here's a table. We got a table set aside for Mike. Like you, you get the preference that comes with the leadership role. Right. That can be dangerous and shouldn't exist in the home. Like it's, I, I don't care if a dad has his own chair in the house, but if it, if he's not serving his home with his leadership, then that's not Christian. So well, what does that leadership look like is the question. Um, I think that that's the New, the New Testament instructions. This is why, I'll just read it to you. 
it, it's not about, man, you need to lead, you need to lead, although you do, but that's not, you won't fail in that way. You'll fail in this way. This is why the instruction is to you this way. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church, because we are members of his body. Do you notice the theme? Husbands, your leadership is for your wife's benefit. Okay, but what does that look like? What do you do? What do you do? I mean, these are the, this is the type of questions that need to be asked. Okay, Mike, husband and wife are sitting at the table with the kids. It's breakfast time. It's time to read the Bible. Can the woman lead the family in the worship time of reading the Bible? Yes or no? Can the man be silent during all that process? Yes or no? Can the wife say, no, we should not refinance the home. Uh, in fact, we should sell the house and move to a new city and get new uh, employment. And you're saying to yourself as the husband, nah, I think that's a bad idea, actually. Do you still do what your wife wants there? Yes or no? Let's say there's a disagreement. Wife says A, husband says B. What do you do? Do you go with B, what the husband wants, because you're the husband, or no? The very practical questions need to be asked of Mike, because this is just blah, 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 blah. Yeah, love your wife, love your wife, just like you love yourself. But what does that actually look like? Practically. Everyday life stuff. What if the wife is a doctor, makes $400,000 a year as a doctor, and you, the husband, are um, a janitor at a high school, and you make $25,000, $35,000 a year, and you have kids. Who should stay home with the kids, the husband or the wife? What's your answer? To me, it's a no-brainer. The husband should stay home. Because you make more money, you're giving away too much money. Money's options. What if your wife is a truck driver? Very, very strong. Buff. Six feet tall. 180 pounds of solid muscle. Woman. You're five foot eight as the husband and 135 pounds scrawny. And you're walking in the dark alley as a family. You shouldn't do that. But who should defend the family there? The wife or the husband? <laughs> what if your wife is a man? <laughs> See, it's... Very pragmatic questions like this that I think bothers Christians because they'll, they'll say with their mouth, yes, uh, the husband's the leader of the home or the headship. Some Christians say this. What does it actually mean when it's applied every day? Doug indirectly just called me scrawny. A 
be right back. No crazies today. Oh yeah, we're ending just before the spammers get in. Good timing. Well, if your dad is fast, he can come on before the music stops. No callers, Waffles. I've succeeded in my mission. 